live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering NAB 2017. Brought to you by HGST. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at NAB 2017 with 100,000 of our closest friends talking all about media, entertainment, and technology. The theme this year is MET because the technology is so mixed in with everything else that you can't separate anymore. And we're really excited to do a deep dive into kind of the customer, uh, or not the customer, excuse me, <laughs> the, the consumer side of this whole world uh, with Eve Berquist. He's the Project Director, Data and Analytics, Entertainment Technology Center at USC. So Eve, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me. So when I was doing some research on, on your segment, really interesting to see that you're involved very much in trying to figure out what people like to watch, how they like to watch, and get a bunch of data because now the, the choices for the consumers of media and entertainment are, are giant, mm -hmm. like never before. Yeah, there's a, there's a very, very basic question that I think not a lot of people in media and entertainment can't answer. It's like, why are people watching your stuff? Uh, and and, and um, they, they have sort of surface level answers, but there's uh, ways that the content out there that well, we watch resonates cognitively with us that is really important, that's very fundamental in how we, we uh, consume media and entertainment. And uh, you know, the, the, even the decision making of, of why we decide to go watch a show on Netflix or play a mobile game or watch a YouTube video, why do we make these specific choices, right? What drives those choices? All these questions uh, don't have a lot of really good answers right now, and that's where, I, I, where we focus all of our work at ETC, is to really understand people's drive to entertain themselves or decisions to entertain themselves uh, at a very deep level and really uh, understand how various narrative structures in film and trailers and brands and advertising uh, resonate with people at a cognitive level. So it's, it's pretty interesting. It, it really goes with the whole big data theme and the, and the AI theme, because now you can capture, collect, measure data in ways, in, in, in consumption, in ways you couldn't never do before, yeah, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So, you know, there's there's three things that are really uh, impacting the media and entertainment industry, and every every industry, really. Um, it's, it's number one is the ability to think in systems, right? Um, you know, we, we, we used to think about problems in a very sort of siloed manner, right? We think about problems in isolation with other forces. Like we look at the flu in isolation with the environment that we're in, stuff like that. Um, there's another way to look at things, and more holistically, it's a system called systems thinking. And the ability to think of audiences as a system, as a just, just like your body's a system inside a system, right? Um, is really revolutionizing the way we're looking at entertainment and media. Uh, the second thing is the availability of data. Just to, there's an enormous amount of data out there. A lot of it is unstructured, but there's, you know, the good thing about entertainment and media is that it, it drives passion and drives conversations. And anything that drives passion and conversation gets very rich in data. And the third thing that uh, is impacting the industry is, is machine learning and AI and the ability to really look at all of these data points across the system holistically in a very intelligent, more semantic manner and make sure that you're measuring the right things. So that for a very, very long time, the media and entertainment industry has been measuring the wrong things, and it's really now catching up very, very fast and making sure that it's measuring the right things. For example, how do we measure how specific narrative structures in film resonate with people cognitively in a way that translates into the box office, right? Um, is there a specific character journey that resonates better in an action movie with males versus females, and how does that how does that matter for how a story is being told? Where do you innovate in script, right? Um, interesting point is the entertainment industry is very unique in that it has two major problems. It's number one, its clients, its customers, uh, are absolute experts in the product. Because if you're 25 or, or 35, how many movies have you watched? Thousands of movies, right? So you're an expert in movies. Certainly, the ones that you like. Exactly. <laughs> uh, if you've if you're 25, you've have you haven't bought hundreds or thousands of cars, right? So, but on the other hand, the, the supplier of the content doesn't know as much as the customer that the customer knows about the product. So you have two problems. You have a really, really, really highly expert client, and but you don't know a lot about that client as a studio, right, or or a network or, or a media company. So that's a very, very unique, distinct challenge that. Uh, that they're starting to, to get very, very smart and very advanced in thinking about. The other thing is 
that I see in the movie industry, and I'm, I'm no expert by any, any stretch of imagination, but it seems like the compression pressure is huge. The budgets have grown to be giant, and you know the number of available weekends for your mm -hmm. release are small, yeah. and the competition for attention and eyeballs around those weekends, it just seems to really mm -hmm. have a, a really high kind of risk reward profile that's getting more and more extreme. But, and, and is that driving people more to kind of the known, it, it, or is it just my perception that you know, they're taking less risks on modifications from the script or modifications uh, of kind of the, the yeah. norm, especially around these big budget. I mean, just the fact that you got version one, two, three, four, five, six, pick your favorite theme, yeah. uh, it seems to be a trend that continues and, and gets even more. I mean, Superman, how many Superman movies are there? Or Spider-Man? So, you know, the that's really interesting, right? So, um, the, 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 the very natural tendency of, um, of the media and entertainment industry is when it doesn't know, you know, as I was mentioning, right, it doesn't know as much as it could or should know about who its audience is. The tendency then becomes to just take less and less risks, you know, in telling stories exactly the same way, and that's why you see a lot of really, really formatted, very formulaic movies. Uh, what we're trying to do is, and the, the, the challenge with that is that, again, you have an audience of experts, and so if every single movie looks like the same one, looks like the other one, you're going to have a problem. People aren't going to go see, see, you know, going to gravitate towards another kind of entertainment or some of your competitors. Um, so you have to know where do you meet people's expectations in a movie, and where do you innovate. Like Deadpool is a really interesting example. Right? Deadpool has the, the the structure of of a basic uh, superhero movie. But it has a lot of innovation underneath that, and so for for the, the the studios knowing where do you stick to the formula and where do you innovate in telling a story uh, when you make a billion dollar movie is going to become more and more interesting because if you innovate too much, you're going to turn people off. If you don't innovate enough, you don't want to turn people off. So we actually have some research looking at the mathematical definition of why we think certain things are interesting and certain things are not interesting, so we can separate. These are the things that you need in your movies. Right? This is some aspects, if you go back to Deadpool, there's some aspects of, of, of Deadpool as a movie that are very traditional of the superhero genre and, and a lot of other aspects that are very, very innovative. So you have to innovate in certain areas and you have to not innovate in areas. And that's a real challenge. And so that's why we're really applying our work to looking at narrative structure and storytelling at ETC is because that's where a lot of the revenue opportunities and, and the de-risking opportunities are. And it's interesting, before we went live, you were talking about thinking of, of storytelling and narrative uh, as a little bit less uh, art and a little bit more science in terms of, of thinking at it in terms of algor you know, algorithms and, and algorithmically, because there are patterns there, there is data there. So what are some of the data that you measure to get there? You, you mentioned earlier that in the past people were measuring the wrong thing. What, what, what are the right things to measure? What are some of the things you guys are measuring now? Yeah, so you know, it, it is still, very much an art, right? Uh, it's making it a little, making art a little bit more optimal. You know, optimizing art is is what we're doing. But it's it, re, it will remain art for a very long time. Um, I think a, for and since we're at NAB, sort of in a broadcasting environment, I think um, you know a, a lot of the measurements and systems that that have been in place for decades now are looking at demographics and demographics, whether you're a male or female, your age, your, your ethnicity, or your income, used to predict what you would watch. It doesn't do that anymore, right? And if you have kids, you know, like me, you watch the same thing that they're watching, you're playing the same video games that they're playing, and so. Um, I think there's um, a new way to measure things more cognitively and semantically and, and you know, Neuroscience is starting to get into the, the, the issue of why do we think certain stories are more interesting or more appealing than others? Why do certain stories lead us to make actual decisions more than others? And so I think at a very, very bas basic level, right, you have to unpack this notion of why do people go see this movie? And it's a system, you know, that decision happens in a system where some of the system is demographics. Demographics aren't going to go away. They're still predictive to a certain extent. But it's also, you know, um, cast. It's also who has recommended this movie, right? It, it, and what are the systems of influence in driving certain people to see a movie? So all of these things, and of course, what we're focusing on, which is sort of storytelling and narrative structure, and how that 
sort of translates to making decisions to see this movie. Um, a lot of, you know, we're still in the infancy of measuring all of this system in a very scientific, granular way, but it's, we're making very, very quick progress, and so even things like understanding the ecosystem of influence around why certain communities are influenced to go see certain movies by other communities, and what, what happens there, right? So, I'll give you an example. We did, uh, we pulled months of data on Reddit about uh, where uh, supporters of Hillary Clinton and when, where supporters of Donald Trump would engage on that topic. Are they talking about that amongst each other? Or are they really going out there and trying to convince other people to vote for Trump or vote for Hillary Clinton? And we saw some two radically different patterns. So pattern number one, the Clinton people would mostly engage with each other on Reddit. So that's cool, that has very little value because you're not being an ambassador. On the other hand, the Trump people were engaging far outside of the Trump subreddit and trying to convince people to join the movement, to donate, to vote for Trump. And so we think there's a model there that can be ported to the entertainment industry where if your fans, if your fan base is mostly engaging with each other, that has less value than if your fan base is really going out there and really trying to get other people excited about your, your, your movie. And why do certain people get excited and how do your fans, what, what argument do your fans use out there to convince others to go see your movie? All these things we're looking at, um, and it's a brand new world now for media and yeah. because of all of these data points. The systems conversation is so interesting because it's not only the system of the individual, but it's, like you said, it's all these systems of influence today. Look at the Yahoo reviews, the Rotten Tomato reviews, you know, what are there, Reddit. You know, as a system of influence, who would have ever thought? Yeah, and we're getting, we're going into a world very quickly, and we're going to be able to understand entertainment and storytelling and narrative and 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 its cognitive power almost on a neural network base, and, and right. looking at what kind of neural network in our brains get fired when we are exposed to this type of character or this type of storyline or, or or this type of of uh, narrative mechanics. And so, this is a really exciting time. The the other thing that's interesting, we talked again a little bit before we turn the cameras on, is about the trailers, mm -hmm. uh, because that's kind of the story within the story, yep. and depending on your objectives uh, and budget, you know, they can make all kinds of number of trailers mm -hmm. in very different ways to approach or to target very mm -hmm. specific audiences. I, you know, I wonder if you could get into that a little bit. Yeah, so you know, uh, in the media and entertainment industry, decisions have been made and if you think about it, it's amazing that the media and entertainment industry has made so much money. So like, I think it's a testament of the enormous creative talent that's, that's involved, right? But, you know, especially for trailers, a lot of the uh, decisions about trailers are made sort of looking at what's worked in the past and in a very sort of haphazard way. It really isn't a lot of data and analytics and science applied to, hey, what kind of trailer, what's, what structure of trailer do we need to put out there in each channel for each target audience to get them really excited about the movie? Because there's many different ways you can present a movie, right? And we've seen, we've all seen many different types of trailers for many different types of movies. Um, what we're doing, and nobody's really worried about, hey, let's analyze, for example, um, the pace, right, the edit cuts, uh, the structure of the edits for the trailer and how that resonates with people. Um, and now we have the ability to do that because people you know, will count views on YouTube, for example, or, or there'll, there'll be a, a way to measure how popular a trailer is. So we're, what we're doing is we're just measuring everything that we can measure about a trailer. Is it a complete story? Um, what is the percentage of the trailers the main character in? What is the percentage of the trailer that the influence character is? And we're looking at cast. Is a trailer, you know, is, does a trailer with Ben Affleck, you know, uh, work better if Ben Affleck is a lot in the trailer or not a lot in the trailer? And what kind of trailer types work better for specific genres, specific target audience, specific channels? So we're really unpacking that into a nice little spreadsheet and measuring all the things that we can measure. And the thing about this is, if you think about the amount of money that's involved in making these decisions. You know, if, uh, if you're a studio and you're spending three, four, five billion dollars a year in marketing expense, and my work can make it even 10% more efficient, that's like half a billion dollars right. in savings. Right. That's real enormous, number. right? So there, it's a really exciting time for media and entertainment because there are all these things are on the horizon to help them make better decisions, more data-driven decisions, and really free up creative, because if we can tell the people who tell the stories in film, 
every, all, you can innovate so much more now because we've, we know that we've boiled it down to a science and we know that in this, you, if you have these four or five things in your script, everywhere else you can innovate, go nuts. Right. I think it's going to free up a lot of creative talent. Really and we're going to see a lot more interesting movies out there. The other piece I think, I mean obviously a, a trailer for a movie is one thing, but, but take that little genre of creative that's purely built to drive yeah. behavior, and that's a commercial. Yeah. And I always joke with my kids, I watch a lot of sports, and there'll be a car ad, and I'm like, just think if you're the poor guy that gets the assignment to make another car yeah. ad. I mean, I how, ma how many car ads have been made yeah. that you got to think creatively? But the data that you're talking about in terms of the narrative, what types of shots are cutting based on the demographic that you're trying to go after for that specific ad, that must be tremendously valuable information. Yeah, it is really valuable. So, you know, our philosophy is that everything is story, right? Your, your tie is a story, your head curts a story, your, your cereal is a story, your car is a story, everything. We make decisions based on the narratives that other people tell us and we tell ourselves about how to represent the world, simply because the universe out there and the reality out there is too complex for our brains to really represent as it is, so we have to simplify it, compress it into a set of, of um, a behavioral script that says, okay, I'm, it's sort of an executive summary of the reality, and the, that executive summary is a story. And so, and it's especially powerful in driving how, what we buy and how we consume things. And so, we're, I've built a platform that looks at, that extracts very, very uh, structured data from conversations about what is the narrative structure around a specific brand, uh, you know, is it you know focused more on you know emotions? Is it focused more on ethics? Is it more focused more on the sort of the utility of the product? And trying to correlate that to look at what kind of narrative structures around your brand, what kind of story around your brand drives more sales? And so that's really really interesting. And sort of understanding again that relation, that cognitive relationship between stories and how efficient they are in driving specific behavior. That is exactly what my my research about. Eve, we could go on all day, but unfortunately, we are out of time. So thank you for uh, thank you. for spending a few minutes and dropping by. Fascinating conversation. Me. All right, he's Eve Burquist from USC, where all the film stuff's happening. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching the Cube. We'll be back from NAB 2017 after this short break. Thanks for watching.